Good morning. It's good to see you all with us, especially if you're visiting with us this morning. You're an honored guest. We appreciate your presence. I invite you to open your Bibles back open to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going to be at this morning. I want us to consider for a few moments this morning a statement that the Apostle Paul makes here in the third chapter and in verse 10. In this section we find out that Paul, expressing his heart as he, as he rarely does, mainly in 2 Corinthians and a few other places, especially in Philippians, but he, re, he says this statement here that I, I think is of a really important practical value for us to consider on this Sunday. And there he says in verse 10 that his goal is that he, may, he might know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sufferings being conformed to his death in order that he might attain to the resurrection from the dead. That statement there, the, the power of of his resurrection. If you were to look at the whole of Christian teaching, it all comes back to the fact that Christ was raised from the dead. And I've said before, as my academic background, I went to know Bible college in Osimaria. I'm a history major. That's, that's what I went to school for. And in our young adults class last Sunday, we emphasized to our high school students that we don't believe in the resurrection because of the Bible. We believe in the Bible because of the resurrection. Because even if you could disprove the Bible, which I don't think you can, there's still an empty tomb in Israel. And the best explanation for the phenomena of Christianity and its rapid spread and expansion is that that person who was in that tomb rose again. It is the central event of history. And everything when it comes to the Christian faith, keeps coming back to the fact that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was crucified, was buried, and raised on the third day. And the fact that he was raised, which is an indisputable historical fact, there is an empty tomb, is one thing that we, that sometimes people forget, that even the enemies of Christianity and of Christ admit that there's an empty tomb because all the, all the, Alternate explanations of why the tomb's empty still admit there's an empty tomb. The disciples stole it. The body was misplaced or something. Well, they haven't been able to find it. They, they still admit there's an empty tomb there. But more importantly for you and I than just there being an empty tomb, it's who is no longer in that tomb. Here Paul... It's admonishing the Philippians, encouraging them to remain steadfast despite the detractors and the false teachers that they were dealing with. And the central way he does that is to point to the transformative power that the resurrection of Christ has in the life of a believer. Paul looks at his own life and we see that the power of the resurrection is what caused Paul to begin with to have this radical transformation. You go from the star Hebrew. He is the poster child of Judaism. In fact, looking, backing up to verse 1 here, Philippians chapter 3. He says here, Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for to write these things again is no trouble to me, and as a safeguard for you, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. I'm going to pause there. I know it makes for bad Bible reading, but we're going to pause. You have a group at Philippi who are trying to convince these Philippians to keep parts of the old law in order to be saved. That's the short of it. 
And what Paul's about ready to say here, now these people were putting confidence in their flesh. That is, that's a, that's a biblicism for just trusting in yourself versus trusting in God. They were trusting in themselves and the actions they were doing to earn their salvation. And here Paul's saying, if anyone has a reason or has any basis to trust in what they did, it was me. I'm the guy. If anyone in living today's basis saying could say that I was saved by works, it's me, and here's why. Verse 4, although I myself might have confidence, confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Here's why. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is found in the law, found blameless. Of the two major sects of Judaism in the first century, the Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees were more exacting and, and, and black and white. Pharisees were more focused on principles, but the big difference was the Pharisees believed in the oral law as well. Sadducees believed in our Old Testament the way we have it. The Pharisees, Old Testament, plus all the other traditions. The reason I say that, because when Paul says that he was a Pharisee and found blameless in regards to the righteousness in the law, he's including all the extra stuff as well. All the stuff that the Pharisees used to get on Jesus about, that the law no were taught. The, the minutia, the nitpicky of making sure you didn't go too far on a Sabbath day, and making sure you counted your, your dill, your mint, and your cumin to make sure you tithed it. That was Paul. And he's saying here, if, I, if there was anyone as a Jew who could say, you know, I was the guy, I'm the guy, but guess what? Verse 7. But whatever these things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so I may gain Christ. I don't know what translation Brother Zach was reading from, but I like how it rendered it. I count them as garbage. Think about all the attainments, all the achievements the Apostle Paul had while he was a Jew. Now I want you to think of a full dumpster in the middle of Tucson, August. That's how he regards all his attainments. His wealth, his social standing. Somebody I, I think I haven't grasped too well in years past is Paul came from a rich family. His parents were able to send him to live in Jerusalem full time to study underneath the rabbi, Gamaliel, right? They had the money to send him away to do that. He had money, power, fame, acclamation. He was the rising star of Judaism. He says all that is filth compared to the life I now have in Christ. We're not going to read it, but it's on the board. In Acts chapter 22, when Paul gives his account of his conversion, which is recorded both in Acts 9 and Acts 22, we might ask, what, what can account for Paul's complete 180 in life? Some have tried to say, say and I, I saw some documentary one time on History Channel, back when they showed documentaries. Um, some tried to say that Paul was simply a Roman plant. He was a spy by the Roman government. First of all, Rome could care less about what some Jews believed about their Messiah. A little side point here. You know how Rome dealt with civil unrest or religions they didn't like? You can't write if you're all dead, and you can't practice religion if you're all dead. It's very efficient. Brutal. Very efficient. They weren't going to care to send spies to figure out, well, what do these people believe? If they didn't like it, they'd just kill them all. 
In fact, Paul was one of the big puzzle pieces that skeptics have to wrestle with because you have, by all accounts, the guy for Judaism changing teams. Paul said it's because he met the risen Lord on that road to Damascus. The very one whom he was persecuting and putting his followers to death. Jesus shows up. You need to go to this place, and you're, Ananias is going to tell you what you need to do. Now, you and I, I, I do a little thought experiment with me. How, how would your faith change? How would it change if Jesus appeared to you in the flesh, and you got to talk with him for an hour? Or if you had a time machine, you could go back to the, the resurrection when he came out of the tomb. How would it change your faith? Now, we probably all have some answers now, don't we? Well, if I saw the risen Lord, I'd, I'd be a much more fervent Christian. That needs to change today. Because why we may have not seen or felt or touched the risen Lord, we have the eyewitness testimony that is just as good. I tell you this, most of ancient history, we're lucky if we get one document that tells us what happens. The Christian faith has dozens from hostile and friendly sources. Christ's resurrection was the pivot point in Paul's life. It should be the pivot point in ours. Secondly, in verse 9, we see that by the power of Christ's resurrection, it resulted in Paul having Christ as his ultimate aim in life. He had forsaken everything on this planet that he might gain Christ. And be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of his own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that he may know him and the power of his resurrection. You look at this man, and it's not just that he made a change or switched teams. He, as, as hard and fervent and devoted he was to Judaism, he applied that much fervor times... 10 to Christ. And that's probably not enough of how to describe it. Every waking moment he had from that day forward after his conversion was to serve and to please and to advance the cause of Jesus. And why is that? By all rights... God could have smited Saul where he stood for his part in the stoning of Stephen. By all rights, Paul could have been smited where he stood due to him being the chief persecutor of Christians. And how many people he willingly and at a time probably even like joyfully put to death because he viewed them as heretics and blasphemers. But God didn't do that. Paul has shown mercy and grace. And God was going to use Paul to achieve great things through the faith. Now, I don't all know what Paul knew outside of what he's revealed in Scripture. But I have to wonder, if did, did Paul knew that his letters were going to be preserved by God to be used for Christians through, until Christ returns for the preaching, edification, and the encouragement of all of us today? And would God have used such a person whose aim in life was anything less than, than Christ? It was such a consuming passion for him that when in chapter 1 and verse 21, he, he would say that for him to die is gain. I'm not there yet, brethren. There's too much sin left in my life. There's too much I like left in this world for me to honestly say, yeah, if I died today, it would be, I know it would be a gain, but I look at Paul's desire. In that section, he's torn between two sections. He's like, if I still live, I, I get to keep on preaching, and it's pretty great. I get to help brethren, but if I die right now, I can be with the Lord, and that's better. 
And there's some days I read that, I'm like, that's not me. Yet. It's an important word for all of us. It may not be you yet. And Paul didn't start out there, obviously, as we've, we've talked about. But his aim, his mission, his life was focused on Christ because he had seen the risen Lord. And the power of Christ's resurrection was the reason for Paul's continued pursuit of Christ and spiritual growth and to become more and more like him. And in the later part of verse 10 through verse 16 here, He might know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that he may obtain to the resurrection of the dead. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it, or have become perfect, but I press on so I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself of having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many who are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, if anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. The point here is that Paul, we think of the Apostle Paul, if there's any Christian ever who who had it figured out, it's Paul, and yet he's saying here that I have not obtained perfection or complete maturity or or even the resurrection of the dead yet. But he pressed on daily towards that direction. He tried his best to forget the failures behind him and the life behind him and pressed on to what's new in front of him. And brethren, if you don't think Paul was kept up at some nights with some of his past actions, you need to read more closely. You look at Romans chapter 7, I'm convinced the Apostle Paul struggled with covetousness. It's his favorite example to give as far as like a sin that the law comes in intention. Think about what it must have felt like for Paul to go to these churches in Jerusalem after becoming an apostle and having that knowledge where he walks in like, how many of your friends and family did I put to death? And yet we have in Corinthians where he, he says, after he lists the long list of beatings and scourgings and, and near drownings and three shipwrecks that we don't have record of other than that statement, of all those things, he says, besides these trivial things, there is daily upon me the pressing need and concern for all the, the churches. If you've been in any sort of position of spiritual leadership, teaching or preaching. Maybe you've served as an elder or currently serving as an elder or even as a deacon. I'm going to give you a little peek behind the door and maybe some insight of what your shepherds deal with. They, they take that burden on joyfully and they love what they do. But I imagine there are nights where they are up late worried. And I think of the Apostle Paul that If it wasn't for Christ's resurrection, man, he probably would have picked any other job in this world than being a preacher and a teacher of the gospel. You look at all the apostles, you look at all the early Christians, they were willing to die for this because of the risen Lord. And now the question comes to us. The resurrection made such an impact on Christ's life. How is it impacting us? You know, it's great when people talk about Jesus risen from the dead. I always appreciate the, the few times a year where people want to talk about Jesus. It's great. But the thing is, Christ, doesn't want him to talk, want, Christ does not want us to only remember him twice a year or three times or how many times people do it. He died and was raised not so he could have the occasional remembrance but your absolute unwavering loyalty and faithfulness to him. 
He didn't come just to get a few days on the calendar, but he came to bring back and save a people that was in the clutches of Satan so he could have fellowship and his people and dwell with them for eternity. His his love is so great that he did that not even having any guarantee that anyone would ever accept that offer. Now, you and I both know that we're not like that. I mean, I check Target's inventory before I go down there just to make sure I'm not wasting a trip. Like, I, I don't want to come away empty-handed, right? We, we, as a race, we're fickle. We, we don't want to invest unless we, we want to get some sort of return on that. Christ did it with no guarantee. We had all of us here this morning, I hope, are here because there is at least some measure of faith and trust in him. And he didn't just die for the mankind generically, but each of us individually. And when I think about Calvary, And he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. I need to start reading that. Father, forgive Brendan, he does not know what he's doing. For it's my sins that put him on that cross. I wasn't even alive yet. God in his infinite knowledge and wisdom and and, and foresight had seen my life. And Romans 3.23 is there for a reason. We all have sinned and it's my sins that put him there and it is Christ dying for me on that cross and if that doesn't move you to tears or something and maybe I'm not preaching it right, it ought to make an impact. He just didn't die for you. He was raised for you. And so have, are we forsaking all for Christ? And I'm not saying this is a on and off decision. It's, it's a daily commitment. It's a daily wrestling you have to do. But Satan doesn't like the fact that you're a Christian. doesn't like the fact that I'm a Christian. And he puts all sorts of things in our way to try and pull us away and get us to doubt and get us to renounce and get us to renege on our faithfulness. But you look at Paul. He gave up his entire way of life for Christ. Think about how hard that would have been. Think about the, what you know of the Gospels and the Jews in the first century. Paul, Paul was giving up family relationships. Paul was giving up everything he really knew, who he thought he knew about the law of God. Because he had to jettison all the man-made traditions. Paul had to learn how to trust in Christ for his salvation, not his own righteousness, as he said in Philippians 3. He had to give up all the fame and acclaim and status he had achieved at such a young age in Judaism for what? To be a vagrant, uh, impoverished, itinerant preacher who was oftentimes met with ridicule, slander. That was from the brethren half the time. If you read 1 and 2 Corinthians. But he did it because Christ was raised. And for us, I'm reminded of a statement Jesus made in Luke's account in chapter 14 and verse 33. Here Christ says, so none of us can be his disciple He does not give up all his own possessions. And he's not talking about go sell everything you have and give it to goodwill. But everything is secondary to him. That's hard. But it's worth it. My time, my goals, my ambitions, my wealth, whatever it is, it is secondary to Christ, if there's anything that's causing a stumbling block for me, it needs to go. Are we on that pathway this morning?
even if it's just there as a seed in your mind that you, you, you can acknowledge or a, 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 a agree with that idea, let's say, I'm willing, willing to consider it, I'm willing to do that, you're on that right path, but there'll be moments in our lives where you'll be required to make those decisions. And Paul had to make this decision daily. But he kept on going back to the fact that he had seen the risen Lord. He had, Christ indeed was raised from the dead. And so that, and we didn't really talk much about this morning, but this is a whole in our lesson, but the fact that Christ was raised from the dead validates everything he taught and every the promise he made and every judgment and warning and blessing. All of it. But see, if he's right about the resurrection... He's right about everything else. And that's the one inescapable fact that I cannot get away from. But I have a moment with you. There are times, and don't, don't pretend your preachers don't go through this, there are times where you, you struggle. You question, is it worth it? You question, do I really believe this? And for me, at least, I, I keep coming back to, I can't dismiss the empty tomb, and I can't dismiss the historical reliability of the New Testament. And that's, that, that's with a secular training on historiography approaching that, you can't get rid of it. And Paul had his days. I mean, I read 2 Timothy that all of his beloved friends had deserted him except Timothy, and Timothy's out preaching. He's left all alone in Rome. You can't tell me that he was not feeling a little bit down in the dumps on those days and wondering, is it worth it? And the answer would be, yes, it is absolutely worth it. And here we have in shorthand, he just says, I, I, he counts all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. So are we in that direction? Are we willing to forsake all for Christ because he indeed has been risen and validates all he's said and all the claims he has made in, on our lives? Has Christ become our ultimate satisfaction or is it, are we aiming that direction? I think far too often in my life I'm far too easily pleased with lesser goods and joys in this life and not Christ as I ought to. Paul in 9 through 10, his aim in life was to know Christ and to share in his sufferings, being conformed to his death, to live a, a cruciformed life as Christ did, and to know intimately the power that came through Christ being raised from the dead. And with that came joys. I know this, the last point, we were really serious, but this, it's serious too, but this, this comes with a joy. Christ in John 15, that, that great sermon before his crucifixion, talks about he came to, so that we may have his joy and have it abundantly. And Paul, while he had to deal with all these hardships, know what I see at the end of all his letters? I see a man who has a rich life with brethren and friends and family who love him, and he loves them. We tend to kind of skip over that, but all of, almost all of Romans 16 is like a laundry list of just like, hey, tell these people I said hi. I'm looking forward to seeing them again. Paul had a very rich life. And everything he had came from the Lord, and he recognized that. Later on, Philippians, he will give thanks to the Philippians for their generous financial gift by his imprisonment. And he's learned how to be content and joyful whether he had the money or didn't have the money. And that came from the Lord. And so, yes, the crucifixion requires, uh, the resurrection requires us to give up all, but it does not leave us empty when Christ makes, makes that demand. He is offering a superior satisfaction that nothing else in this world can even come close to. And so often, we get so easily pleased with, with sinful pleasures 
And the thing is with those pleasures, if you have to go outside of God to get joy and satisfaction, you're going to have to stay out of God to keep it. And that pleasure will eventually fade and pass. Christ offers the superior. And finally this morning, I appreciate your kind attention. Has your faith in Christ, what he came to do, has it made a difference in your life? Again, we look back at Paul. The complete 180 he made. It made a radical difference in his life. As we've been studying Wednesday nights in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the big marker, the defining characteristic, the big thing that should be evident in your life if you are a Christian is more and more greater love for your brethren and your fellow man. Recognizing the love for your fellow man, recognizing that you were just like people outside of Christ, ignorant, unaware of your sins, and somebody some, someday loved you enough to tell you about Jesus. Instead of raging at the world, and yes, there's many things we need to be worried about and, and mourn over, but we need to see the world with sympathy and love. Because Christ's statement, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, not only applies to you, it applies to everybody. And his resurrection should make us more loving with our friends and our family and our brethren because we are all the same type of people who Christ chose to save. We all have our backgrounds and sins and we're all working towards that goal of becoming more like Christ. And guess what? Sometimes we get it wrong. I like how Paul, referring to his conversion in 1 Timothy, telling Timothy on how to be more compassionate and, and loving with the congregation he's serving with, be looking 14 and 15 through 16. He said it's a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this very reason, I found mercy. So in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. If you highlight or mark your Bibles into verse 16 is one verse I highly recommend. Think about Paul. He, by inspiration, can call himself the chiefest of sinners. And yet, Paul says it was through him that Christ demonstrates his patience towards you and I in our salvation and, and, and growing and, and working it out. We tend to forget Paul spent three years in Arabia. Don't really know what he was doing that time. But there was a period of time in his life where he was learning the Christian faith before he came back to Jerusalem and so forth to go into full-time preaching. There was a period in his life where he had to learn and grow into his faith. And so, as we consider the resurrection, has it made a difference in your life? Are you on that pathway of willing to forsake all for Christ? Are you seeking to have Christ become a greater and greater satisfaction in your life and, and, and being done with lesser pleasures? And can you see a difference in your life? Because it's great if we say he is risen, but what does that mean? How are you living in light of that? Because if he was risen from the dead and it also means he's coming in judgment one day to collect his own and, and make all wrongs right. And that day's fixed. Maybe you're here this morning, you've been convicted, and you've, you really haven't been doing anything with Christ. Well, there's water ready. We will afford you an opportunity in just a moment, and you do us the honor if you would, as you're ready to make that commitment to Christ. He, Christ himself said in Mark 16, 16, that the one who believed in him and is baptized shall be saved. The one who believes not stands condemned. We can help you with that. We'd be happy to do so. But maybe you've done that in the past and you're in sin. 
and you need to confess that. Or you, you're struggling as a Christian, you need prayers of encouragement. You've accepted the Lord's invitation. Why don't you meet me down here at the front as together we stand to sing the song that's been selected.